good morning good afternoon good evening uh, wherever you are uh, first of all as a panel uh, we would like to thank horasis and especially frank uh, uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to discuss a very important topic on supply chains related to pandemic uh, let me introduce myself uh, my name is shailendra goswami i will be the moderator for this particular session i am the chairman and managing director of uh, pushkaraj group which is based uh, in uh, uh, india and uh, in a city pune which is on the western uh, front of india we are discussing today about supply chains uh, last 3 years have been different and uh, we uh, therefore need to offer a perspective on uh, the changes uh, those have taken place uh, in uh, the supply chains i have uh, a couple of studies uh, to refer to one of the studies which i felt uh, was uh, in sync with what we are discussing was uh, published by Ernst and Young and uh, i'd like to take a couple of excerpts for, uh, from that uh, research shows uh, that several uh, disruptions through the pandemic uh, drove enterprise to make their supply chains more resilient collaborative and networked multiple national lockdowns slowed or even temporarily stopped the flow of raw materials and finished goods disrupting manufacturing as a result overall it has accelerated and magnified problems that already existed in the supply chain enterprises plan to shake up their supply chain strategies to become more resilient collaborative and networked with customers suppliers and other stakeholders naturally to do that they will increase investments in supply chain technologies like uh, artificial intelligence and uh, robotic process automation while retaining workers which is most important big changes are on the horizon for supply chains greater supply chain visibility efficiency and resilience are on the top of the mind the future of supply chains uh, is digital and autonomous the journey to digitized and uh, lights out operation has begun in all earnestness ultimately digital and autonomous technologies will help make people's jobs easier and the supply chain more efficient and optimized now having uh, said this uh, i have a very eminent uh, uh, pa panel here with uh, panel members uh, girish uh, uh, then swarupani ye and george from different parts of the world and i would uh, certainly be requesting uh, each one of them to give their perspective and uh, i don't know why they've been giving that instead ah so i i'm not going to go to the preamble again um, they did not record it earlier so fine so i'm going to request uh, uh, my panelists fellow panelists uh, to uh, Uh, give their perspective one by one uh, to start with uh, may i request uh, swaroop uh, ladies first to give her perspective on the topic that we have been discussing thank you mr goswami um good morning good afternoon and hello to everyone around the world and uh, thank you for joining us today my name is swaroop and i'm from coast research it's a research and advisory firm headquartered in new york and we have colleagues in uh, london hong kong um nigeria and india and uh, we cover retail and uh, tech at the intersection and we work with retailers around the world we also work with uh, startups that work at the intersection of retail and tech and uh, what we've been seeing uh, you know primarily in the retail sector in terms of um, the challenges that that a lot of businesses are facing It, it still continues to be, uh, you know, high costs around shipping. Um, the average weekly rate to ship a forty-foot container moving from Asia to North America was fifteen thousand dollars in April, which is close to two hundred percent above pre-pandemic levels, which was thousand five hundred dollars before, um, you know, the pandemic struck. And inflation in the U.S. is at an all-time high. U.S. CPI was eight point three percent in April, although it's a Um, a slight downtick from what it was in March. It's still at you know 40-year record highs, and demand isn't slowing at all. It's still very very robust. 
um, US retail sales was up for 6.4%. The, the, the results were out just a couple of days ago, uh, 6.4% year over year, up from March's 3.8%. But otherwise, you know, very strong demand, particularly in clothing. Um, as people return to pre-pandemic activities, restri- restrictions have been lifted. So people are switching back from buying, um, you know, relaxed clothing to office clothing or, you know, outdoor wear and what have you. So um, we have strong demand and, again, strong uh, factors that are challenging retailers, such as high costs, high, high shipping costs, high inflation. And the top three issues that apparel brands and retailers are citing based on a co-site research survey that we conducted last month is product speed to market, shipping delays, and logistic costs. Um, And same goes for consumer goods suppliers and retailers as well. The top three supply chain challenges are rising costs, 54% of them cited that, shipping delays, and lack of accurate supply chain data. The lack of visibility that's sort of um, hindering them from reacting quickly from being agile and resilient. So considering how deeply entrenched various aspects of the global supply chain are, any disruption along, you know, even some of the minor aspects of the supply chain obviously cause a domino effect across the board. So something happening in China is, of course, affecting uh, businesses all the way up to the US. And then we have this domino effect going around the world. So. Um, we had a couple of recommendations that we've been um, you know, uh, driving through our research and our, our reports and uh, advisory projects with uh, the companies that we work with. So end-to-end digitalization of sourcing or supply chain processes because um, this is best time. Um, in adversity, we, we do have opportunities. So this is the time to digitalize if they haven't or to make sure that there are no gaps because um, we've had businesses work in silos. And then, of course, you have retailers that are um, you know, upgrading all of their tech. But then we have suppliers down the supply chain where their tech is not matching what the retailers are doing. So they're not talking to each other. And then they're working in silos. And then we also have agents in between who are adding to the loss of data there. And there is no continuous flow of data that results in the lack of visibility, as I'm sure you're seeing in, in you know, um, whatever sectors you're covering as well. And um, apart from, you know, looking at the Far East for sourcing, uh, companies are looking at nearshoring. But while that sounds really good in theory, it, it is going to be a while before it can be practically possible. Of course, there is the aspect of finding suitable suppliers and, com- and countries nearer to the U.S. market that can you know, uh, produce the same quality of goods that they're able to get at the same costs and all of that. But incrementally, it's possible, maybe. So they could explore acquisition ships and, and look at that as an incremental movement from the East to West. And uh, sourcing strategies need to be designed with the sustainability focus in mind. Sorry, um, I... I I'm not able to hear you. Oh. Able to hear you. Yeah. Could others please mute uh, so that the recording doesn't get affected? Right. Okay. So um, as they're thinking of overhauling their supply chains and you know restrategizing for agility and resilience and all of that and upskilling their task force or uh, upgrading their tech and all of that. They need to think about uh, sustainability at the heart of everything because it's not just uh, consumers that are demanding um, you know, uh, sustainability in what they're buying. It's also investors. It's also employees. Everyone's thinking about it going forward. And of course, we are coming closer and closer to the 2030 um, SDG goals outlined by the UN. So with urgency, companies need to act on that and that's something uh, you know brands and retailers could think about when they're redesigning their sourcing strategies. And, um, and another aspect that we've looked at is centralizing sourcing activities because um, as globalization you know, pervaded, um, there was an aspect that sort of got decentralized around the world. And then again, uh, teams within, within each of the businesses stopped talking to each other. 
And then went the loss of data and the increase in costs and uh, you know, all subsequent actions that follow that. But centralizing sourcing activities and eliminating intermediaries to an extent could help companies drive sourcing efficiencies at scale. And um, of course, this would vary. It, it could look different for each sector within retail in itself because the way a paddle retailer sources is very different from the way furniture retailers source and then the way grocery retailers source and so on. But to the extent they can and um, look at regionalizing some of their sourcing, not really near shoring, but looking at other sources that could uh, reduce some of the pressure on, on single source countries and, um, you know, probably speed up or shorten the supply chain. Because the way we're looking at it now, at least for apparel, it's um, uh, about 40 days to delivery from door to door. And um, everyone's, you know, uh, worried about the, the speed to market. And with the recent lockdowns in China, um, they're trying to rehaul their, their sourcing and, and look at it um, much earlier in the year. So instead of getting deliveries just before holiday period, they're already thinking about getting in holiday inventory and we're only in May. So that's how early companies are thinking about it. And Walmart, which reported uh, just two days ago, was saying that its inventory is up 33%, which is much higher than it's typically in uh, the previous quarters. So um, while, you know, they have to have higher levels of inventory, of course, that there are, you know, costs that come with it, but that cost may seem better in the long run than the cost of ordering and not getting inventory in, in time and then having to cancel the order or bear the costs of, of those orders. So those are some of the aspects that we've been looking at and, and what, um, you know, we, we'd like to consider. Uh, thank you, Swarbha. Uh, I could uh, certainly see that uh, you feel there were challenges, but then certainly it has given us a food for art, doing a lot of introspection and then trying to work out strategies to overcome them. Well, I have uh, with me uh, this uh, uh, subject which is being discussed in great length by Yi. Uh, he will be talking about impacts, trends and opportunities on the tech industry. So can I uh, leave uh, the mic to you, Yi? You might be on mute, uh, E. I think, uh, E, uh, by the time you sort it out, uh, let me go to Girish. Uh, could you please take over? Uh, sure. Thank you, first of all. Um, it's a pleasure to come back and speak again at Horasis. So let me, I come from an industry which is seeing most of the digitization go through across multiple sectors. So if I set a context about what we have been seeing, um, like what Swarup has been saying, there are certain sectors like CPG, pharmaceuticals, as well as big box, big box retailers who have had a significant demand surge. Whereas there has been many sectors like travel, automotive and some other industrial segments have really struggled to keep their light, lights on during this particular COVID time. And if I look at one common thread which is running through these difficult business sectors, it's nothing but a chaotic supply and demand situation characterized by extensive volatility and lack of supply chain visibility. So if I look at what has been the factors which has been hindering supply chain re resiliency, I mean, there are certain factors why companies are still not doing what they, are, what they should be doing to make their supply chains resilient. First and foremost is the focus on short term. There has been a significant focus on um, looking at what is the near term demand, whereas not planning ahead. Okay? That is one, one issue that I've seen. The second issue that I see is that there has also been a significant pressure on cost. And uh, if you look, look, look at it, I mean, the cost disparity between legacy man manufacturers and new entrants like OEMs versus new electric vehicles add one more pressure to the whole uh, dimension. Okay. 
And the third issue that I see is that there has been a lot of uh, companies which are still on the legacy supply chain issues, which is just in time, lean inventory and all of that. Okay. And we have to see how much of those is applicable right now. But if I look at COVID and the COVID's impact on this, I believe the, sub, the real silver line from COVID is that we knew that there will be future pandemics as well as other, other disruptions. This means that we need to, uh, there is a need for resilience, uh, which, can, which cannot be overemphasized. And it needs for us to uh, actually reinvent supply chains and the supporting operating model. And if I look at businesses, what businesses need to do is to build a connected ecosystem across supply, manufacturing and demand. Okay. And it, should, it has to be continuously monitored and optimized using AI, machine learning and predictive analytics. Let me give you a simple example. We work with a, a very interesting company, uh, which is a supply chain um, company in, um, in uh, Australia, one of the largest retailers. And uh, the whole idea behind uh, this was that is there a way by which we can get um, fresh food, which is we, we picked up strawberries and lettuce right from farm to folk. And is there a way by which we can keep it fresh through the entire supply chain? And what we put together was that we put simple motion sensors. So it sensors in every uh, after every strawberry is plucked and the sensors actually track temperature, moisture, all of that through the entire supply chain so that by the time it reaches your shelf uh, or your fridge, it contain it, it. We keep the same optimal temperature through the entire supply chain, and by, by doing that, we are able to get the freshness in the food. Okay. So, what the pandemic has really brought about is that I strongly believe that the pandemic has brought made every company a technology company. There used to be technology before, but today the pandemic has really brought uh, technology to be technology to be the single most driver in as far as uh, any any company is concerned okay. and uh, in my point of view which is the tcs point of view if there is one takeaway that leaders have to take on and if you have to move the needle forward we strongly believe sustainability is and will be one of the greater challenges and opportunities we we face today and many experts have um, around the world have raised the pertinent point of sustainability and digital. Okay. So TCS, we decided that we, we, we will, we have to do something about it. And we created actually a study with the University of Auckland to create the first digital sustainability index in, in Asia Pacific to see where does the intersection of digitization and sustainability meet. Okay. And uh, this is an interesting thing. And if we go back to the public of uh, supply chain, the digital sustainability index clearly shows that digital is expected to play a significant role in all aspects of business, especially supply chain as well as in demand planning. Okay. And we need to build in more predictive methods to look at hub and spoke as well as transportation hub of suppliers. So reimagining procurement system through digitization and reevaluating the risks is, is most, most critical. So in short, what I want to say is that executives really need to put on their sustainability lens while planning for a supply chain that is robust as well as predictable. I believe that we have not seen the full scale of digital transformation yet. And I thought I will conclude by giving some five mega trends that will continue to drive this revolution. First and foremost, digital adoption. Okay, What is very clear is that a digital foundation that supports predictive, collaborative, and self-healing capabilities is build is fundamental to building, su uh, sustaining resiliency over the over the over the long term. Okay, and all companies will have to be data and AI driven. Okay, with robots as well as bots playing a significant role, and that is something which no industry can exp uh, can really escape. The second important thing is supply chain rebalancing. The emerging political geopolitical situation is fundamentally rebalancing the global supply chains and with about 70% of the world's growth to come from emerging economies in the coming decade. And with the uncertainties in geopolitical situations and future pandemics, supply chains have to be designed for resiliency 
and not really for efficiency. The third thing which I talked about is listing sustainability as the third me mega trend. And we all have to look at how do we address the climate change chal challenges through tech and uh, how do we bring this up to the fore. The fourth one is about health. Health and wellness related value propositions will assume more importance as our lives and pri priorities take a major re reboot. And this will have an impact on the way we work. And the final point that I want to make is about talent. This is related to the fourth point, but uh, we need to see what is the, going to be the availability on a global talent. So companies have to shift away from traditional models and be open to accessing 24 by 7 talent from any part of the world, aided by what new technology plus platforms as well as new ways of working. And leaders will have to really embrace the changes and create environments and policies that will help organizations stay successful and resilient in this new normal. So I want to reiterate, I think you know, there'll be five important things, digital adoption, supply chain rebalancing, sustainability, health, as well as talent. If you are able to look at all of this, I strongly believe that we can build something uh, which is for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Girish. Uh, that was wonderful uh, way of putting uh, things in perspective. I fully endorse uh, the uh, future preparedness, uh, the point which you brought about, because this is uh, the beginning of that era of pandemics. And this is not going to be the only pandemic. So we have to have a strategy to have that preparedness uh, in future for some other pandemics, which we don't know. So disaster management uh, has been the subject which has been taught, uh, but not clearly understood and certainly not implemented. But these last two years have really made us think about uh, that disaster management. And then everyone is applying their mind. And which is where I also endorse your point of view that uh, we need to create uh, uh, resilience and uh, sustainability in our supply chain. While we also understand that uh, the future supply chains are going to be digital and autonomous, we need to uh, know the difference between doing digital and being digital. Because, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, a different uh, perspective that really comes about. And uh, another point, which uh, I also understand from both of you, which you have spoken, that uh, this pandemic has not added anything uh, in the existing problems of supply chain. Correct. It has only aggravated those problems which were there already. So because of pandemic, we haven't had any new challenge as far as supply chain was concerned. Now, while we are discussing the supply ch chain uh, challenges and uh, opportunities i would request ye to uh, give his perspective if your mic is all right well uh, it looks like uh, i will have to go to george uh, uh, well george uh, we all have been uh, from the asian uh, perspective uh, Said, uh, I would like to take yours uh, from the U.S. Please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? You can hear me, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is a great topic. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is George uh, Wang. Uh, uh, I'm from uh, EBI. Uh, we are... Uh, supply chain and uh, contract manufacturing uh, management company. Uh, we've been in business for about 22 years, uh, helping a uh, number, several hundred companies uh, managing their global supply chain uh, contract manufacturing. About uh, half of our clients there uh, in the North America and the other half too, they are in Europe, uh, Singapore, Australia, Africa, going many different ways. So yeah, so this uh, we have personally experiencing uh, every year different kind of uh, challenges for the supply chain, right? At literally year by year, you know, every three months there are always something happens that's become. Uh, disruptive 
to the supply chain in the last 22 years. And nothing can uh, beat the uh, pandemic, the impact. Normally in the old days, there are raw material problem, right? There are currency problem, uh, this and that, political problem, you know, uh, manufacturing resource problem. So that has always been happening. And until we have this uh, pandemic, that's become a true uh, re resilience test for how well is the supply chain. <laughs> and, you know, the, the problem uh, really come from many different area, right? So it's kind of like you have several tsunami happening all at the same time, you know, the logistics, right? That's not just the shipping, you know, container problem, it's the ship problem. Is the is the port problem? Is the local truck driver problem? On everywhere, right? And then the lockdown problem. So that's just one, right? Then beyond that, you know, you have all these other uh, list: <laughs> the geopolitical problem, the shortage of the ships problem, and you know, material delivery problem, tier two, tier three. You know that's it's a uh, is that has been ongoing uh, in the last uh, two and a half years, and it's kind of a beyond the uh, most people's uh, capability to manage. And you know, for all the people I know here in the U.S., all these uh, buyers, you know, uh, supply chain managers, they are non sleepless. <laughs> <laughs> been the highest pressure in the last two years, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And yeah, then the, then the, yeah, then the action is actually very limited. And nowadays, you know, most of the people have to source bidding, you know, for the components, for the raw material to pay the high price. That's every day in the last one and a half years. You're hunting for the shortage of the chips, right? You know, I need 10,000. And then for this batch, and they only have 500. The price is 100 times higher. The, you know, the 30 cents chip now cost $80 each. Are you still going to make the product or not? Right? And is that business still worth it? The shipping, right? Do you still want to keep the clients? You know, if you don't ship to Walmart, if you don't ship to Best Buy, all these big stores, that's the end of your game. And Target, you know, all those big guys, you know, they're, they just said that that's just an open policy. No price hike up. Okay. If you don't deliver, your shelf will be emptied. Somebody else will fill in by some other stuff. So that was a tough time. You know, I know everybody have their own issue, right? You talk about it, you raise the price, and then how about the consumers, right? And they are already oh, you uh, have all the impact. You know, lost job. You know, no money. And then the government, of course, gave some money out, and then all of a sudden, this inflation's come along. So what the heck? So, so that's kind of the uh, the the uh, reality, and the talk has been ongoing. You know, made locally, and build up a factory. Um, then there's a shortage of people. Right, there's no labor, and you cannot get anything done. So that's the reality. All the uh, for being the front line. Um, supply chain management <laughs> that they are facing every day. So that's the really the reality show. Yeah. So uh, talking about uh, just in time, um, that perfect world situation, right? Um, usually that's come from the CFO. They want to just in time because their least financial liability, you know. So best looking book, but. Uh, this time, you know, they have to at once lose money out just to keep the business running. You know, that's the reality. It's tough 
situation. Yeah, so uh, um, uh, the resilience now, of course, uh, everyone is looking for sourcing around the world and local or from China, a lot of them mostly. Now uh, in the Southeast Asia countries or Mexico or India, everywhere, right? So um, right now, I think that's kind of in the transition time, basically, because you need to establish the ecosystem and you need to dial in all these subcontractors line up and each one of them have their own, you know, priority and reference, right? And they have their own cost structure and every business all have their own cost down that's that you know so it doesn't come easy uh, it's a quite a suffering process but it is kind of a migrating i think right now it is really in this transition time and uh, uh not really clear what's going to happen but i'm sure in the next two three years you'll see the result hopefully uh it can be predictable <laughs> And then you can move along. You know the rough direction, but the reality, you have to plan everything, you know, step by step and try it out, see how does it work. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a, the whole, you know, it's a very tough situation. You know, I think a, a, aside from the Ukraine war, you know, the Russian, you know, whatever that war happens, uh, it's just a kind of a inflation going on. That's a, that's the reality, right? You know, um, yeah, it's <laughs> all the companies have to fight for the survival and see who will be the left. And as far as the digital, I think in the U.S., they have already done that digitization, uh, the real-time thing uh, around the world, you know, like 10, 15 years ago for the ERP pretty much, unless they are mom and pop, little shop, all the companies have already done that, everything, but that doesn't solve any problem for, for the one, the problem we're talking about, right? What about all those short of a container? What are you gonna do with the truck driver? That's all politics, you know, all kinds of things, you know, going on. And then, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, uh, that's the reality. So the point I'm trying to say is really from the uh, practical angle. Uh, the uh, the whole world is really uh, in this new restructuring time, and there are a lot of opportunity. And I think a lot of Southeast Asia countries, you know, uh, they are having India or uh, anywhere else. They have a lot of great opportunity, but meanwhile. They also have uh, many uh, uh, political issues, the tax and bureaucratic. There are a lot of those things that are still there. So, yeah, we've been in many different countries, you know, um, and it's, it's pretty tough to get a supply chain set up and then the quality dialed into the place. And then there's a certain way of operation, right? You have to fit the uh, JIT in a way because that's very demanding for the supply chain. So that's, uh, yeah, so so far uh, we still have majority of them come from China and uh, um, they have been uh, the best performer even through the last two years. It's really not a manufacturing issue other than the shortage of chips. But other countries are through the through the uh, lockdowns back and forth, so we we see uh, um, so we start to see uh, uh, some type a certain sector of the business right it's ramping up, uh, which is really good. So that can be a backup resource, and then possibly down the road can be lower cost too. You know, so yeah. And so uh, it's just my yeah sharing the personal <laughs> experience. Thank, yeah, thank you, George. I couldn't agree more on the multiple and the frequent uh, challenges that you have brought about. 
be it uh, raw material, be it currency, political uh, manufacturing, logistics, lockdowns, and whatnot. But like we say, that knowing all these particular problems, uh, at least we have the list of problems that we are aware of. Knowing the problems itself is 50% finding the solutions. So the balance 51% is what is required to be done. And mm -hmm. uh, we know exactly what we are supposed to work on. And accordingly, those things have been worked out. What we have been saying is uh, digital or autonomous or resilience or sustainability, all these things put together, we will certainly come out as winner uh, in preparing ourselves uh, for the future pandemics or the future situations and try to improve uh, the efficiencies of the entire supply chain. But it also needs uh, uh, the supply chain needs to be connected, uh, complete uh, across uh, planning, procurement, manufacturing and logistics and work beyond the organization because what all we have been discussing is yes the systems part of it within the organization we could go digital we could do the manufacturing etc but supply chain uh, includes the logistic part of it so you are traveling from a destination a to a destination b there are a whole lot of things uh, which are physically moving and there we do not have control because of uh, all the problems or the challenges uh, which you have said uh, uh, about the logistics part of it, whether it be the world order, whether it be the turbulence mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. countries or whether it is a political uh, scenario. Now, earlier, uh, uh, pre-pandemic, we used to commit a particular delivery that uh, from a destination A to destination B, we could ship the material in such and such time. But today it is totally uncertain. If it reaches, thank God. If it uh, does not reach, count uh, how many days it will be delayed or how many months it will be delayed. So we have been perfecting that art of uh, uh, making that logistic systems also more efficient, but it will certainly evolve as we go along because all the intelligent minds have been uh, uh, applying their minds uh, to better the system. I would uh, certainly take the perspective from you finally. I hope your mic works. Uh, best of luck. And, uh, give me... technology guy. <laughs> yeah. this still doesn't work. No, uh, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, <laughs> I, uh, I'm very sorry for him. Guy uh, uh, has so, prepared. Give me one more try. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. All yours. That's the last, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm E, co-founder of Mawatech. Mawatech is an international connectivity provider. So our focus is to serve uh, telecommunication companies, internet players, and software providers regarding the international network demand. Also support their inter internationalization and digitization process. For example, we're the exclusive partner of Deutsche Telekom, global carrier in the APEC region. So I'm very happy to join the panel today and be also at the Horace meeting again. <laughs> so, and probably I can see a wide range of the impact on the telecommunication tech industry in the supply chain management. Probably I just share a bit um, more my observations and thoughts around uh, four areas. Also a bit of opportunities and I, and I, I, I see there. Yeah. So firstly, I can totally underpin the trend of uh, regionalization. So I can see a lot of companies either adding more regional warehousing cap capacities or build a new regional production sites. Because in our industry, building a new production site often requires a um, huge investment and long lead time. Currently, I see actually more companies are adding more regional warehousing capacity, also overordering critical components. In addition, I can also see actually they have increased the time to deliver the goods towards the customer. But uh, in the mid to long term, actually, I can see a lot of companies in the telco and tech industry actually are considering to um, build up actually regional production sites. I think it's due to actually drastically increase the logic cost and also the ge geopolitical uncertainty. Yeah, this is uh, to be very frank. So, for example, one of actually the um, telco equipment provider we're dealing with they just had the product. They just have their production in Asia only today, and now they are considering actually building a new factory in the U.S., which I think was very unlikely in the past. Key driver that is actually 
much increased uh, transatlantic logistics cost. So I think within two years already three times higher, three times higher. And uh, also they also need to actually have uh, more actually resilience against the unpredicted events like pandemic. So, yeah. But, um, I think um, what I can observe uh, in other words is um, business continuity um, plays now much higher role than the actually just maximizing economic skills, like uh, I think just Girish also, also mentioned. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, I do think this is also um, actually a good opportunity for many countries to attract um, new investment and build local talents. Just give an example, because I'm living in Singapore. I think uh, Singapore is um, actively promoting its uh, business-friendly and uh, politically stable environment, also its commitment on actually sustainability. And the government uh, channels now a lot of effort to build actually to upscale the risk of their local workforce, so to attract companies to set up their regional hubs or production sites in Singapore. And uh, I can, at least I can see so far, actually, this strategy has been proven quite successful. Yeah. And so the, the second point um, I would like to mention, I think, um, um, many of you already mentioned is uh, the accelerated uh, digitalization process along the supply chain. I think not only the acceleration is much deeper, then the reason is, as you already mentioned, is to require actually a full end-to-end -end view along the supply chain process. Also the traceability. One of actually our partner, telco, also a telco equipment provider, had to stop their production just recently. The reason was actually one of the key supplier had problem in their own supply chain and system, the lack of one very critical raw material. So I think uh, such incidents actually um, also showed actually the necessity to gain a full end-to-end -end view along the supply chain process. I think McKinsey also did a survey and uh, the survey estimated uh, only 2% of companies do have the visibility into the uh, supply chain base, supplier base beyond the tier two supplier. So I think this is still a lot of room actually to catch up. But at the same time, I think these companies can also use this as an opportunity to revisit their digitalization process along supply chain management and also to build actually new risk management tools and uh, practices there. Furthermore, I, I do think uh, this, um, probably this challenge, but also the new demand to have a full end-to-end -end view will help company to be more actually future resilient um, and also business proof. Just uh, for example, from a sustainability perspective, and uh, you can actually really track and also prove carbon footprint, the origin of the materials, etc. Et so this, uh, and then the third point, um, uh, I can observe is actually, uh, um, I think uh, it's a reshuffle of the relationship between sub, um, buyers and suppliers. I think due to the pandemic, geopolitical tension, the shortage of the materials, um, many companies start looking into a more strategic relationship. Just uh, give me an example, end of last year, um, Ford and General Motors, they have actually signed a strategic agreement uh, with chip makers. So they will jointly develop and eventually also manufacture chips together. I think for Ford and General, Electronic, uh, General Motors, also they, beyond the supply chain challenge, they also realize uh, actually computer power and IT capability are quite crucial for the automakers in the future. So my own view is um, I do believe um, such strategic partnership will actually um, increase in the future. And uh, this also leads to actually a more actually long-term commitment uh, and, uh, between supplier and buyers, which I think in turn also enable a higher investment. And uh, this can enable actually longer planning horizon, for example, building new factories and uh, investing into the R&Ds, et cetera, et cetera. So this is some actually also opportunity I see, I see there. Last but not least, just very quickly, I, I, I do think this is also a great opportunity for the SMEs yeah, to use the opportunity to digitalize their process, including supply chain, supply chain management. But here, I think they do also face a bit different challenges. For example, the high initial investment cost. So just from 
my own from our industry perspective, I think uh, for those companies from tech and te technology and telco companies who are willing to pay attention to those SMEs and to offer actually solutions, uh, is this, this pinpoints. I think there are also a lot of opportunity there. So probably there are the four things um, I see the changes, but probably I'm more positive on that also to see this also will trigger actually a bit more, uh, actually uh, more opportunities at the same time, yeah, all the changes. will actually make the companies uh, um, to digitalize more their process and also to strengthen their strategic position. And uh, from the supply chain man management perspective would be more future-proof and sustain sustainable. So just is uh, very quickly actually probably my source and observations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, and uh, don't go on mute again because then if I want to call you again, <laughs> uh, you will have problems. <laughs> well, uh, just to uh, make a couple of comments, uh, what you have said, Yi, is certainly uh, important on the regional hubs uh, point of view because that could save uh, the logistics uh, hassles or the challenges which uh, George uh, just brought about. And certainly it will add up to the cost. But then what we are discussing is performance. And why we are discussing performance? Because the entire ecosystem needs to be operative. The economy has to move forward. So today, when we are discussing various challenges, uh, at some cost, everything has a price to pay. So we may pay some additional uh, cost or we may sacrifice on certain efficiencies which uh, Grish uh, brought about. That performance is more important than efficiencies at this particular juncture. Till such time, we do not really create a resilient and sustainable uh, supply chain management. While uh, we have been discussing uh, many points, uh, I personally feel that the entire supply chain management has to be inclusive, which has to include include the entire ecosystem in the sense the OEMs, the tier ones, the tier twos, uh, all the players in the system will have to be uh, inclusive in that particular supply chain, which means anything, any platform of digital nature that you have been creating, everyone has to be a part of it. And how can we forget our own workers? who have been working in a conventional manner earlier. Now, those workers uh, will have to go through an efficiency and reskilling uh, uh, programs uh, because you cannot suddenly ask them to jump from level one of uh, digital uh, uh, expertise to level 10 of digital expertise of AI, IoT and whatnot. So we need to focus our efforts on efficiency and reskilling of our workers. And this should become uh, one of the top priorities in the coming years. There is another aspect which uh, I feel uh, we should be looking at is the cost optimization. In the supply chain will always be a focus. Yes, it has got to be. But like I said, that everything has a price. So even in the face of building uh, our additional resiliency, this cost aspect will take a little backseat. We are already seeing a shift from a linear supply chain change to the more integrated uh, networks connecting many players, which is where I brought about that point of inclusiveness. And uh, everyone will have to focus on that. Now, most of uh, us have agreed that, or rather have uh, opined, that the future supply chains are going to be digital and uh, uh, the race is therefore on as far as digital enablement or automation is concerned. The autonomous supply chain, for example, uh, robots in warehouses and stores or drivers forklifts and trucks, uh, delivery drones or fully automated planning, I can see that in next couple of years, all these things will be a reality, which earlier we never uh, thought that uh, should be uh, the one. But then um, while uh, the supply chain of the future will need to be agile, flexible, efficient, resilient, and digitally networked for improved visibility, organizations therefore should focus on five priorities. The way Girish gave five priorities, I'm adding another five priorities. I don't know how people are going to cope up with all these priorities. But nevertheless, at least let us put it down and then understand uh, what kind of priorities are these. The number one could be reimagine the strategic architecture of your supply chain, build transparency and resiliency, extract cash and cost from your supply chain, create a competitive advantage and sustainability, drive agility and opportunities for growth through a digital supply chain. I think with this, uh, we have addressed more or less everything, but I would like to take uh, the opportunity to give everyone uh, a chance to, to make a closing remark. Uh, let us start with Girish. Yeah, my only thing is um, until now, supply chains have always been um, developed for efficiency, 
we need to when we start building the new supply chains we should start building it for resiliency not efficiency thank you yep how about you uh, swarupa so um, i think there needs to be greater partnership across the supply chain and as you rightly mentioned we want to digitalize so much but of course there's a great deal of reskilling that needs to be done so uh, whoever is digitalizing the fastest let's say at least on the retailer side if it's the retail businesses they need to work um, in even closer quarters with their suppliers because of course they don't have visibility beyond tier 1 or tier 2 suppliers so laying on those policies to work in closer partnership so they're all on the same page and digitalizing together to improve visibility okay thank you how about you uh, e and actually i can just quickly underpin what you said i think supply chain management is not the only supply chain is actually we have to look at it into a total ecosystem and uh, so also in the end uh, taking every challenge as opportunity this is the way also i to see it and uh, it actually accelerated to, to resolve a lot of issues have been seen so far but uh, now actually even more future proof and more future proof actually in the business you are mute i think you are on mute now <laughs> you are on mute sorry george uh, your comments yeah yeah uh i think the uh, uh the f- the future of supply chain uh, right now in this transition time and the driving force right for the supply chain is really the invisible hand the cost so now with this uncertainty and with build up the redundancy or or the resilience how much cost each company are willing to pay that will be the ceo or the board's decision and it's uh, going to be a challenging one uh i think in the down the road aside from all these other uh problems you know situations and eventually in the long run the invisible hand is still going to win so you know, for the real optimization and the benefit you know that still should be the number one thing you know regardless that's the rules where did it go right this goes through the the law is a point <laughs> so that's that's will be the true di- true direction the real the real benefit for the business i think that's that's the still the number one for every business yeah thank you george uh, i think uh, i got a notification our time has left but then we can keep discussing so i'll just stop uh, the streaming part of it and uh,